guys, this is AC Service Tech, and today what we're looking at is the refrigerant cycle. All right, right here we have an evaporator coil. This is also referred to as the indoor coil. Right here we have uh, the outdoor unit, whether this is a heat pump or a condenser. We're just going to look at this as if it's a, a condensing unit, a normal outside air conditioner. All right. Uh, as you can see that these are piped together. We are on the inside of the building. This is a training unit. All right. This unit right here is normally that's all going to be installed outside and this will be installed either right in front of your furnace or as part of your air handler all right so uh, this is where you absorb heat from the house and you're going to be rejecting it here outside in your outdoor unit all right so how it works you have low pressure low temperature vapor refrigerant in the large line heading back to the compressor all right Here's your service valve right over here, all right, but it heads into straight into the compressor and it turns into a high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant, okay, which will be roughly in the coil, roughly the top third or so, okay. As it rejects heat outside, it starts turning into a saturated state where you have the middle third, all right. A saturated state means liquid and vapor both exist at the same time. As it rejects more heat, it turns into a liquid refrigerant down here in the bottom third, all right? So right here, right about that last third, right where it starts at, when it turns into a complete liquid, the temperature decrease from here, all right, until it comes out in your liquid line over here, okay? That's called your subcooling. It's a temperature decrease in liquid form, all right? So from this, from where it stops being a saturated temperature in the coil, all right, in and it turns into a liquid state, all right, the temperature decrease where it comes out at right here on your liquid line, all right, that's called the subcooling. You know that because your subcooling, you can check your pressure here, you bring it into your 410A, all right, and you can read the saturated temperature, and that will tell you the saturated temperature that's in the middle of this coil while the unit's running. And then you just take your temperature reading within a few inches of your red liquid line, all right, and this will be lower by however many degrees. Normally it's 8 to 12 degrees uh, temperature decrease in liquid form, but I've seen as high as 17 stated on the rating plate up here, okay, all right, that the manufacturer is calling for, all right, and you would be checking subcooling for a charging process if you had a thermostatic expansion valve located right here, all right. This is a, it says it has a TXV right here. Okay, so after it turns into a subcooled liquid, all right, it's going to turn into a subcooled liquid regardless of whether you have a piston or a, uh, or a capillary tube or a TXV here, okay? It's just a matter of which way you charge it will be which one you use for charging, whether this one or this one, all right? But well, let me just continue on here. We have our uh, high pressure high temperature liquid refrigerant, it's a subcooled liquid refrigerant, it heads through the filter dryer which traps uh, water vapor, all right, and it heads into the metering device. After it goes through the metering device, either right in front of the evaporator coil or right inside the evaporator, evaporator coil box, it turns into a low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant, okay, and we can say that that's the bottom third, all right. Technically, it's 80% liquid, 20% flash gas, but we're going to refer to it as a as a liquid here, low pressure, low temperature liquid, all right? As it absorbs heat from the house, all right, that's what it's doing, it's removing heat, it turns into a saturated state, all right, where both liquid and vapor both exist, all right? Then after it's absorbed a decent amount of heat, it turns into a complete vapor, and the top third will be where the vapor exists, all right? So the temperature increase from where it turns into a vapor to where it comes out at on the suction line, that's called the superheat. If you had a service valve here, you could take the pressure and the temperature right here, you could check the actual superheat, okay? We normally check it back here, all right, back at this service valve, and that could be 50 foot, 100 foot away, all right? Um, and that's why it's called the total superheat. You may pick up a, a degree or two of, uh, a temperature increase or reject a couple degrees by the time you get to your port here, all right? But a couple degrees isn't going to hurt you as long as you, you want to keep this line insulated, all right? So it does not pick up or reject heat, all right? So you have a low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant that is superheated, okay? It's going to be coming back to this valve here, 
and then it starts the cycle all over again. It goes back into the compressor as a low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant. Now, uh, the T if you have a TXV, it's going to try to hold a certain amount of superheat. All right. If you have a piston or orifice though here, right where it goes in, you can charge it via the superheat process. All right. So you can tell what superheat you have by having your blue line attached right here and a temperature probe uh, connected onto your large vapor line. All right. So what you do is you take your vapor pressure, you follow it into your Fortinet, all right, whatever it may be, okay, and you're going to see what the saturated temperature is, all right. Now the actual temperature on this line from your temp probe will be higher than your saturated temperature here, okay. So it's this temperature right here minus this temperature, and that will get you your actual superheat, all right. So that's your actual. You, you still need to find how much it needs to be charged to, okay? And unlike subcoin, which is found on the rating plate on the, on the unit at all times, it's always on the unit. Unlike that, you actually have to take a wet bulb indoor temperature, all right? You're going to take that at the largest return grill in the house or the building, all right? Or the, the closest, biggest return grill where it's going to be taking most of the air. Take a wet bulb reading with a psychrometer, whether it's a sling psychrometer or a digital psychrometer. And what you're going to do is you're going to take that temperature, all right, and you're going to put it on the superheat chart. And you're also going to line up the outdoor temperature. It's going to be the in the uh, outdoor entering air temp for your outdoor AC unit. All right, so right around in this area, staying maybe about six inches away, uh, out of the sun. If this unit's outside, you're just basically taking a dry bulb temperature outside all right where the air enters into this coil remember that the air comes in the sides and gets blown out the top all right so you're just checking the outside air temp all right along with the wet bulb that'll give you a target superheat and then you if your if your actual superheat that you read with your temp probe here and your gauge set if that's higher than your target superheat then you need to add refrigerant all right, all right. just to run through this one more time you have low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant goes into the compressor. All right, turns into a high pressure, high temperature vapor refrigerant. All right, and the first third on the top here will be your very high temperature, high pressure vapor refrigerant as it's rejecting heat outside. It turns into a saturated state here, and then it starts to turn into a complete liquid as it rejects uh, heat. It lowers the temperature of the liquid refrigerant. Okay until it comes out at this liquid port here, okay? And that's where you have a subcooled, uh, high pressure, high temperature liquid refrigerant, which is actually subcooled. It goes through the filter dryer into the metering device where it turns into a low pressure, low temperature liquid refrigerant, 80% liquid, 20% flash gas. And that will happen down here at the bottom third. Then it turns into its saturated state as it absorbs heat from the house. All right, and then it turns into a superheated vapor, the temperature increase in vapor form. All right, as it's absorbing heat from the house. And it comes back out as a superheated, low pressure, low temperature vapor refrigerant, and it comes back to the compressor. And then the cycle starts all over again. All right, you need some superheat in order for this uh, to definitely confirm that there's going to be some vapor, or mo mostly vapor and no liquid, all right, going into your compressor. All right, it's a vapor compressor inside of this thing, and you should not have any liquid, all right? So by having a superheated vapor, you are making sure that there's no way for this thing to uh, reject enough heat to turn into a liquid before it gets into the compressor in there. All right. And then the cycle starts all over again. That compressor turns it into a high pressure uh, vapor refrigerant and it starts rejecting heat outside again. All right. Hope that helped. Hope you enjoyed yourself. We'll see you next time. AC Service Tech Channel.